Buildings, the structures we humans erect, especially those grand ones and impressive ones, are often used as a status symbol, a way to show your accomplishments. And uh, as cities and nations, it's a way to show the world your abilities, a visual representation of what your mind is capable of and what kinds of bits of engineering you can accomplish. And as you recall, this drive to build impressive structures goes back to the biblical account of the Tower of Babylon, well, Tower of Babel, when, where man uh, set to show the world and God that they can make a name for themselves, as Genesis 11 puts it. And it's an arrogant there at the Tower of ba Babel, an arrogant attempt to di display their greatness. Since then, this fascination with making impressive man-made structures has been a mark of the human race. Think about the Great Pyramid in Egypt or the Colosseum in Rome or the Great Wall in China or the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, Taj Mahal in India, and Notre Dame de Paris in France, the Empire State Building in New York, and Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and countless of other impressive buildings and structures throughout the times and throughout the places, cathedrals, fortresses, mosques, palaces, temples, dams, canals, skyscrapers, and lots and lots of other buildings provide us with a sense of pride and accomplishments and represent to us the greatness of our minds and the physical abilities to erect something that is so massive yet solid and impressive and reliable buildings and structures are a means for human race or a nation or a culture to be evaluated for its importance. Think about what are you going to be impressed with more, a city filled with skyscrapers or a village made out of huts, made out of straw and mud. Big, beautiful, solid houses and buildings and structures speak of wealth and importance and comfort and safety and security and abundance and ease while those lowly dwellings evoke the imagery of poverty crime, lack of resources, a struggle to survive, and we see it in any city or town, including your own. The COVID-19 virus, this microscopic, tiny, invisible enemy, has easily broken into what we thought were solid structures that we've built. This minuscule germ pays no attention to the edifices we built. It just breaks in, affecting all kinds of people from skyscraper city dwellers to mobile home residents and everyone in between around the world, across our nation, within our state, right here in our county, and even in our city right now. And all the great and mighty structures we've erected that made us feel confident and secure from the growing economy and stock market and low unemployment rates and the overabundance of consumer goods and services and easily accessible education and recreation 
and medical care to the politicians promising a great future to the tremendous growth in the medical research and even if, if you live in our area, the medical facilities, you probably have noticed how huge those expansion and building projects of the hospital facilities are in our state. All of those man-made fortresses that were meant to keep us safe and secure and confident and comfortable have been conquered by a tiny microscopic virus. Not a mighty fortress is our self. The great structures and the institutions that we've built to provide us, they give us very little cover. We're like Adam and Eve who sew together fig leaves in a feeble attempt to find some cover. And just like them, we hunker down, afraid. The old evil foe, he only means deadly woe because that's what he is. He arms himself to fight with any craft and dreadful might he can get his hands on, including the coronavirus, and that has no equal and no medicine to cure or a vaccine to prevent it. Yet, no strength of ours can match his might. You recognize, of course, the themes from that great hymn of Martin Luther's that we just sang. And you might know by now, because it's been circulated in the, in the last few weeks, that Luther himself survived the bubonic plague that came to his town of Wittenberg, Germany, in 1527. And everyone who could get out, they got out of the village. And then the elector of Saxony, John the Steadfast, he actually ordered the famous professor and reformer, Martin Luther, to leave. And Martin Luther refused, and along with his pregnant wife, Katharina, Luther stayed in his hometown, in his town, opening his house as the ward for the sick. And two, later, two years later, he wrote the famous, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And as you know about this hymn, it speaks about our human institutions and our human aspects and realms. It speaks of the land, the world, the spouse, the children, and it speaks about all those institutions threatened by the enemy. But then it focuses on the spiritual side of the battles we fight. The Word of God fleshes it out for us through the writings of Peter in our epistle this morning, which speaks of our human sufferings as we live in a hostile world. And it's using those strong words to describe it. Peter speaks of the people of God experiencing harm, fear, trouble, slander, being reviled or insulted and abused. But all those physical manifestations are a reflection of the spiritual battle that's underlying all of this. Let me read it to you. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as the removal of dirt from the body, 
but is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. In the days of Noah, as you recall, the people, the humans, grew so confident in their own minds and in their own abilities that they had no use for God and his word. They no longer relied on God's provision, but in their arrogance considered themselves, their structures, their institutions, their ways of life, the strongholds, the foundations of their existence. And so when Noah built the ark, a floating fortress to protect the faithful people of God, they openly slandered, reviled, insulted, abused, and laughed at him. To them, his building, that ark, wasn't anything of any value. Instead of boarding the God-given ark of salvation, they continued to stick to their guns. But even before the flood waters filled the land and devoured them, they themselves beat those flood waters to the punch by devouring their lives in pleasures and pursuits of their own flesh that only fattened them for the slaughter to come. The devils of sin and death still fill our land, eager to devour us. And we still make their jobs easier by fattening ourselves, by consuming our lives in pursuit of the same flesh-gratifying desires. There's no better confession for our pathetic state than this. No strength of ours can match his might. We would be lost, rejected. It is, therefore, the sweetest word of the gospel that now a champion comes to fight whom God himself elected. He takes down the structures, the institutions, the earthly strongholds that we've built for ourselves that can't fight the devils and the virus. He drowns our arrogance and reliance on our human might and ushers us through the spear-hewn door in the sight of Christ, our ark, into the church where we are dry and safe from the rising waters. Through our baptism, which corresponds to this, as Peter points out, he brings us safely into the ark of the church, and he floods and drowns the sin and death in us. He feeds us the manna of his body and touches our lips with a chalice filled with blood that flowed from the rock of his riven side. And God always holds us safe. Therefore, we will not fear, though an unmighty fortress is our life. The institutions that we've built, no more than sand castles when faced with death in its many forms. A mighty fortress is our God. The hymn is based on Psalm 46, which has these words. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. 
the God of Jacob is our fortress. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Though the climate should change and the earth give way and the mountains erupt in earthquakes and floods and hurricanes come, we will not fear. Though sin and death will separate us from our loved ones, even wives and children, though our reputations will be reviled, our names slandered, even our health taken by a virus or any other sickness, though all these be gone, our victory has been already won. They cannot win the day. The kingdom is ours forever. Therefore, be still. You are safe in the ark of the kingdom of God. You're safe in the ark in the sight of Christ. You're safe in the ark of his church. The Lord Almighty is with us. He is our fortress. Amen.